<laughs> My bad on that. <laughs> Why? Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, it really, with this many students gone, it's not your fault. It's just that uh, it really is serious. And the only thing I can't make myself do is remember stuff. And the more I put pressure on myself, the more I forget, right? Because that's partly why people don't remember stuff. They have too much pressure on them, but okay, stress. whatever. What? I said stress. Well, I'll tell you when I was, when I was uh, your age, I never called it stress. I called it pressure. Um, but I do, I do think you should be careful in validating stress because then it just, you don't find some way to deal with those hormones. You just sort of let them wash over you. If, if you say, oh, I'm stressed and your friend goes, oh, I'm stressed, you know, then you just, you just let those hormones keep flowing. <laughs> um, so I don't think you should deny it. You just have to find a way to, to transform it, right? Um, so Ethel recommended rest, but of course that's a big problem. That's what you can't do. <laughs> but the way I dealt, well, I just said, okay, this is grown up life. And just here's, here's what I'd recommend because when I was 21, I was married and I had a baby and I was going to school full time. So when my students, you know, feel stressed, I just say, well, it's going to get worse, right? You're going to have probably a partner and there'll be days when that isn't going well. And then you're going to have little kids and they'll be crying and keep you up all night. And if you, you know, if you mistreat them, you're crippling them, right? And they will come back to you. They'll, you know, you'll see the mistakes you made in your children's character. And so all I'm telling you is that please learn to process it because it only gets worse, right? Um, I would just emphasize having good friends and encouraging other each other and sort of inspiring, find some way to be creative, right? How can I um, how, envision yourself? Like what kind of person do I wanna be? Uh, looking back, Five years from now, I not only don't have regrets, but I also feel like, yeah, that was a good way to handle it, right? You can just, it's a creating your life. You're creating your life. It's like a work of art. And so I hope you can um, find ways to be creative about how you deal with all your responsibilities. Um, Oh, I used to eat, right? That's one, that's one way to deal with it, right? Is you would just eat. And so some of that sugar or whatever would get in your body and you'd feel a little better, but that's not a good way to do it either. Um, all right, so the next section of the class, as I say in the, in the pre-class video, so for all of you who are not here, which is quite a few, you will be able to see the pre-class video. It's only 38 minutes. It's worth going back and doing. But in general, we've done a lot, obviously with Aristotle and classical virtues. And now we're gonna talk about humanism as a, an intellectual tradition, a worldview tradition. And Corliss Lamont explains how the ancient humanism the Greeks and Romans, it was tied to Christianity. And then in the modern era, it broke off for various reasons. And now there are many different kinds. And then I, I, I asked you to comment on the difference between the Humanist Manifesto in 1933, 1973, and 2000, because I do think um, studying this material is a, a really important um, touch, touch point for whether our country is polarized or not. Is there a need for the polarization? What's the source of the polarization? 
Well, it's that a lot of people with a lot of good intentions and who are exercising a lot of virtues um, are demonizing each other due to ignorance or the refusal to understand the common ground. And there's so much common ground. And yet, I, I think you can tell by reading those manifestos that there also is potential to take these manifestos or Christian manifestos and you can either unify them and weave the society together or you can use them as a way to unravel things and destabilize society. So does that make sense to you that these kinds of discussions can lead to either uh, integration of society, strong middle class, or disintegration um, and unraveling. So let me, um, I, I asked you to look over, right, read the first 12 pages, three points that you wanted to bring up. Um, all right, so this is, this is the outline, the importance of philosophy, the definition of humanism, um, ethics, politics, um, the USA, its humanistic tradition, the different kinds. I didn't made you, make you read all of this, but Renaissance means rebirth, and it was the rebirth of the classics. That was what it was referring to. Um, academic humanism, that was just what the um, academics did, just a small elite. Um, Catholics, the St. Thomas Aquinas integrated Aristotle with, with Christianity. Um, and then there were all these different varieties, the Unitarians. Um, ethical culture societies, whatever. And the one thing that's of interest is that America, there were two reasons people came to America. One was economic opportunity. They could move up social mobility because social mobility is so critical to maintain a democracy. People will follow the rule of law they will avoid undermining the society if they feel like they have something invested, like they have hope for a better life or they have hope for a better life for their children. So people came to America for that opportunity and they had hope of a better life and a better life for their children. Social mobility in the US has stagnated and gone down. And so we were number one in social mobility for a long time. And the last I read were 17th, 17th, right? Uh, that's really shocking. Um, if you live in a certain zip code, your likelihood of going to college is just about zero. This is really a serious issue because if you get people without hope, then you have instability. And, our founding fathers were very concerned with that. So that was one reason um, people came to America. The other reason was religious freedom. And so the thing that's interesting there is that some people came who had a very anti-science, anti-intellectual uh, branch of religion, fundamentalism, you name it. There were all these branches on the right and they came, you know, because they didn't get persecuted. My Baptist, Swedish Baptist relatives came so they didn't have to, so that the Lutheran, the Lutherans in charge uh, didn't make them baptize their babies, okay? Um, so there were the ones that were anti-intellectual who split science from religion. And then there were the super religious ones the rationalists who preferred science to religion. So they either marginalized religion or, you know, 
they really, a number of them were probably closet atheists. I don't know how many of them were overt atheists. So religious freedom meant anything, you know, this huge spectrum. And it was unique in the world for that reason, that our founders united reason and faith. 85 of them were Church of England. They, they themselves did, but they wanted a country where everyone was tolerated, right? So because they knew all the harm that religious intolerance does, it pits people against each other and it allows demagogues, politically ambitious people to poke, right? You know, if you if I vote for me, I won't, you know, I will condemn, you know, this religion or that religion or I'll represent God and the true God and the true religion, right? Uh, you know, the state's appropriate religion, like Socrates got in trouble, right? For not following the state, the official state religion. So they definitely wanted toleration. They had read all of that material about Athens. Um, so England, a lot of them came from England because England had had quite a few varieties, but these people were politically marginalized. They didn't have equal rights. Um, all right, and then communism came in later on. And then, um, so I want you first to react in general, and then I'll have you reacting to the manifestos and then the difference between the manifestos and all of that stuff. So let me get your first reactions right now to the reading. So Titus, what was your, what did you want to say on that first reaction? In general, I agreed with most of it, but it seemed like the human, the philosophy of humanism, it seemed like it kind of attacked religion more than the 2000 manifesto that spoke more in general. Like, for example, they were saying, they were talking about how there is no need for religious things. It's all based on the human and responsible. I'm looking for a quick example. And then one thing I didn't agree with it was when they said something like, where is it? Hmm. Like when they said they discouraged sentimental and unreal hopes and riskful thinking. I don't know. It just seems like they were attacking religion too much for me. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll go off what he said. Okay. So I read one of the um, the essays or whatever, the Christian, and I felt like the earlier manifestos were more secular. It talked about the secular compared to like the religion and the um, Christian humanisms. So I did think that, and then um, just off that, like a few that I thought were pointed out to me was under the practicalism of the 2000 manifesto. Under the what? I think this is the right place. I'm trying to pull it up, but I'm not really sure exactly what all my notes meant. But it was like practicalism knows object of choice. I'm under the right notes. Yeah. What was that first word again? Practical wisdom. Oh, practical wisdom. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, it just sounds like practicalism. And <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a whole sometimes. No, no. I mean, really, I should have been able to figure it out, but I couldn't. Um, but it was practicalism. It was like no object of choice. And that one like kind of hit home with me because it like listed the steps and it was like, then you get to the step to make a decision, like make a choice based off the knowledge. And I feel like that's where I struggle. And I feel like a lot of people that I know personally struggle at that point. But that one was just kind of interesting to me. But I did more of the differences, but I guess that's not what we're doing right now. So I'll wait. You'll wait. Okay. Jason, you want to comment? Um, yeah. Uh, from the reading, there's um there's like this like at the very beginning, um, it said 
In order to attain a reason interpretation of nature and man, the philosopher must inquire into the major branches of natural sciences, such as chemistry, astronomy, and biology, and likewise of the social sciences, such as history, economics, and, and politics. Um, I think that one stuck out to me because like, whenever uh, you think about like humanism and like the whole idea of philosophy, you think like more um, morals kind of thing. I don't, I don't know that. I think that's just personally me, not necessarily like um, uh, divulging into like, the area of science such as like biology and that other stuff so i guess um i guess it's more of a question of like which one plays a bigger role when it comes to like uh humanism and and the study of man i guess okay good uh, uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i did the uh, reading on the peru can you wait can you hear me all right cool so i, was, I did the reading on the the peru and the human rights and what really stuck out to me was um, the definition of se sexual segregation. So okay, you have the wrong week. <laughs> I, had to, I thought I did because uh, it said the Friday uh, re revised assignment, right? Was that the right one? Okay, you need to scroll down, you know, every time, and then figure out, you know, what we've covered and what we haven't. Um, I mean, you're not the only one. I don't. I just can't quite figure out why. So let yeah, me. I was a little lost because I, I I looked at the Friday one and I was like, okay. So I'm gonna have to put the dates. But all right. So you go to the bottom, right? And it's the world view. And so, um, welcome to R40, right? Um, then we had uh, July seventh. Okay. And then we had, okay, so I do need uh, edited July 8th. You'll have to look, right? Edited July 8th. So here's Friday's class, right? That was last week. Then you have um, July 12th, right? Monday, mm -hmm. uh, July 13th, Tuesday, and then Wednesday. I forgot to put it, said edited July 14th. And then um, uh, Thursday, edited July 14th. There's going to be some signal in there, right? right? And it says Friday's assignment edited yesterday, right? So from now on, please, you know, um, because you do have to scroll down a lot, okay? Because there's no point in me having to do this all over again. Um, so, and I'm glad I'm recording this. Please, please be careful that you get the right one, right? Um, because the other thing about it is that you know that we're going to do paper two this weekend, right? And it does have paper topics there. So that's one indication. And you could look at the paper topics and see if they're if the paper topics actually correspond to what we've been reading, right? So if you look at the paper topics here, Aristotle's personal, social, political, and it has um, Aristotle and management, Aristotle capabilities, that's what we've been reading. So every day on a Friday, you're gonna have to, you know, there's going to be paper topics. And to make sure you've got the right week, check the paper topics, right? Does that make sense? Um, then if you wanted to write about, oh, well, anyway, I that's what I, I would like you to write about political, practical wisdom, political wisdom. Um, okay, so that means Trey hasn't done the assignment. Um, so, uh, so Trey, that's okay. Let me see, what did you say? And then I'll see if I can figure out how to incorporate it here. So I think I did the wrong reading, but uh, on the, the wrong Friday one. So, right. So per uh, what okay. I had read, what I had went over, it was over like um, women's segregation. That's what it went over. 
Right. So it's um, it's a paper about the most extreme form of women's sexual segregation. Um, it does. It has occurred in the past. It's changing. Uh, but what did you think of the paper in general? Uh, so it, I might not have like all the, the stuff that I need because it wasn't the right thing. Right. OK, so that's what we'll get that. We'll get to that later. Um, let's see the second round of questions. All right, let me just go to some of those. All right, so what about number one? The importance of philosophy, right? Um, does it make sense to you now why somebody would say that philosophy is important? Because, you know, when you started the class, well, what's a worldview and why should I care, right? You had there wasn't any conscious awareness that you had a worldview or it meant anything. I have no idea the word. Um, but are you starting to understand that actually somebody around me has had one and my mind keeps trying to make sense out of life? And so I do have something because when somebody comes and says, like when I'm reading some of this stuff, it punches buttons in my head, right? So you've got something in your head. And so the next question is, you really ought to re-examine it. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself pitting yourself against good people and identifying with bad people because they punch the button. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, I think the readings today should make you aware, just like Socrates, that there are people who are exercise the virtues, but they don't like religion, but they act just like Jesus. And there are people who are always talking about God and Jesus and they do not exercise the virtues. Does everybody understand that? And if if all you do have buttons that were you were taught when you were little, God button, the God button, the atheist button, the whatever button, you're you're not going to make good judgment, right? You're not going to exercise practical wisdom. So this class is trying to get you to uh, re-examine your assumptions to systematize, to commit to keeping an open mind and not making assumptions. Um, and also this particular reading like Jason read that what you read Jason is about this way of synthesizing, right? Philosophy, theology, science, social science, whatever. And the humanists are claiming that if you want to synthesize, you have to be a humanist. And I'm saying that's not true. And the Pope, the Pope synthesizes science, theology, philosophy, and social science into his worldview. And so do the, the mainline churches also do. So it's not fair. There's no reason at all to say that religion has to be anti-intellectual in any sense of intellectual, but some rel religions are anti-intellectual in various senses. You know that, right? There's plenty of churches you know of that don't believe in evolution. It's not a, it's not a matter of believing it. You accept it or you don't, right? So they don't accept scientific method. They don't accept the conclusions from scientific method, but, but the Catholic church does. So people think that if you accept evolution, your conclusion is that religion is worthless, but that's not true. <laughs> the Catholic church doesn't believe that. Um, Muslims, some Muslims do, some don't. Um, Christians, okay, so that's a false dilemma. Um, but then there are humanists that think religion, any sense of religion, 
is anti-science and that is not true. <laughs> and so there are extremists and there are people on each side that demonize and stereotype and oversimplify the debate. Now, um, I just wanna ask you, does that make sense to you? Do you guys understand that that would be an oversimplification, but that people do it? Um, Mary Hannah. Yes, ma'am. Did that occur to you when you were reading this stuff? Uh, I mean, not, and I don't think I took it into that much depth, but yes, like it made sense to me like that did. All right, um, let me, Michael, I'm gonna wait for you because you have to make up, you know, you have to start at the beginning with whatever you thought. So let me just continue this thought and then I'll go to Michael. Uh, Titus, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it kind of reminds me of other actual people who are pretty one-sided about religion and science. Like they either believe, well, when it comes to evolutionary versus creation, that's really where they have the most argument about because they don't believe that both can happen. But in biology, we learned that it could. Okay, the other thing is when, when people seem to think that if you don't accept evolution, like you don't have virtue, right? Like, there's so many virtuous people on both sides of that debate. It shouldn't divide people as much as it does. Does that make sense, Titus? Yeah, it's like they're using the wrong things to judge people. Right. It should be temperance, courage, generosity, even, right? It should be the virtues. Uh, remember, Jesus had the virtues. Socrates had the virtues. So what we're doing is... Um, the, the conservatives are condemning the Socrateses of the world, right? And then the Critos who defend Socrates are trashing the conservatives. Does that make sense? I mean, it was polarized then along the same lines as it's polarized now, and it brought the democracy down. Um, does that make sense to you, Titus? Yes, it does. To me, it really isn't about what you believe, but how it influences your actions. Right. And that's why I'm asking you to re-examine your worldview so that, you know, when you write it at the end of the semester, you account for that. You actually have explained to yourself what you really think corresponds to the world. And then that will govern how you treat other people. Um, and and that polarization is taking our country down. And I think these are the issues upon which people get polarized. There's no need for polarization. And people who exercise a lot of virtue, but then who condemn other people who exercise a lot of virtue, but they just have a different philosophy, that's killing us, that's killing our country. Um, and it was the same in Athens. Um, Jason, what do you think? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of kind of indifferent on this, uh, what the um, whole chain of thought you're going along with, because uh, I, I guess kind of hard, I guess, to say, um, to like, because um, when you brought up the whole evolution thing, I, I wouldn't say like evolution. Like, um, if you if you accept it, then you're not uh, in, in, you're denying religion. But if you know you you accept like the idea of creation, you're denying evolution. I think it's kind of um, I don't know, I don't know. It's hard to explain. Um, I guess it kind of it's kind of hard to have like to believe uh, or well, not believe, but accept both. Um, because you, you know one like is like literally a whole different like um you know uh thought and then the other one is like it's just a whole different am i 
I don't know. I don't know how to explain. It's kind of like you you were talking about how like um with like evolution and stuff and and I was thinking like it's kind of hard to like accept both as true kind of. Well, the thing is every professor at Lyon does. Okay? <laughs> or they wouldn't be there. And so that's what I just have to let you know is that tradition of liberal arts education is based on that union of reason and faith, right? That's why it's a Presbyterian school, but they teach science, social science, math, philosophy, theology, whatever. Um, so that's, and then the next step is, even if people don't accept creation, I mean, if they're on that side, one or the other, are they incapable of being good citizens? Does that make them incapable of practical wisdom? Okay, Jason, so you say no, right? Right. Right, and so, but then when they start demonizing each other, then they're incapable of practical wisdom. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's a vice to label somebody and refuse to, you know, empathize with them or work together on problems with them. That's a vice, right? Mm -hmm. That's prejudice to prejudge. And that's what our founders did not want to happen. And that's why they had town hall meetings, right? Town hall meetings. You can go to any church you want, but you come to this meeting and you're relating to each other as citizens and you solve problems. You solve community problems. Um, okay. But I think, you know, our country right now is going through a whole lot of uh, agony about this issue. And the politicians are using it to polarize people. And again, our founders are very worried about that. If people don't learn how to see each other as rational people capable of deliberation, if they refuse to talk to each other, then a politician will come right in there and use that to get votes, right? And then you're then you're in trouble because they'll use their power to help their friends and harm their enemies, just like in Athens. Um, all right, so let's see, uh, who's next? Trey. Uh, kind of what I got from that was basically like we all have our own way of living and we all need to find or we are trying to find our meaning of living so whether that be like whatever we are living for i mean philosophy is kind of just whatever we decide to go forth with and pursue so like if we don't really have something to live for we don't really have a motivation to keep on going and and trying to like pursue something so that's really what i got for that and then like it said uh, human existence and it said uh, consistent and compelling view of human existence and solution to their problems. But basically, like we're all going to run into problems and stuff like that. And it might, you know, come to a point where it comes like a barricade and we feel kind of shut down or something like that. But eventually we're going to have to figure out our own problems and continue to go on with our life. And, and that's really what the significance is to me, pretty much. And so we all really like go on and we figure out our problems and we continue to solve our problems, which kind of gives us more motivation to live. Right, okay. Okay, and people, people are always trying to make sense out of things, right? And that's why they have, that's why you have these crazy conspiracy theories. It's, it's, it's based on this desire to understand, right? And to relieve fear and anxiety and to try to have hope, whatever. Um, but as the climate changes, for example, which it will, and, and you guys are really in for a lot of trouble. Um, some people will say it's the end times. We don't have to do anything, right? They'll have this whole book of revelation interpretation. Other people will say, God gave us brains. We're supposed to use them. You know, we're going to roast in hell if we destroy the creation. There's nothing worse, right? than destroying God's creation. So in the name of God, we gotta fix this. 
And then other people will say, get religion out of this. This is how we got into this. We got to have science, right? Just, I don't want religion. Give me science, science, more science. We got to have everybody becoming a, a purely secular humanist or we're not going to solve it. Does that make sense, Trey? Right. And you guys are going to have to deal with it. Um, but I do think among, you know, if you took a, a poll about who are the most likely to be able to build bridges and move forward, it would be Lion students, that type of student, first generation, uh, growing up amidst people with seriously different worldviews, uh, growing up, you know, either splitting reason and faith, but actually knowing a whole lot of people that don't and working with them or growing up unifying them, but actually going to school and living with a lot of people that don't. So I think, you know, my students over the years at Lyon are set up to be the bridge builders. Um, do, do all of you understand that? And partly it's, we accept students at Lyon. You can be atheist, agnostic, whatever, but you have to be temperate and generous and even tempered and have appropriate ambition and appropriate honor. We try to honor people, self-knowledge, friendships. So the community is really based on and cultivating those virtues, but we don't care what your worldview is, right? Um, the reason I like philosophy I, I actually could have gone to Harvard Divinity School or Yale Divinity School, but the reason I chose philosophy, you don't have to start with God. You could start anywhere, right? So I have students that, I had a student who was a Satanist, right? I'm a Satanist. Okay, well, tell me why. Why are you a Satanist, right? What is it about Satanism that attracts you? And actually, for some people that have a lot of anger, a lot of darkness for whatever reason, they go to those ceremonies and it's like a release. And it really makes them more integrated and more calm. Does that make sense to you guys? I mean, there can be a good reason. Uh, going to a Satanist, uh, worshiping the devil doesn't mean necessarily imitating the devil <laughs> it can mean being aware of your capacity for evil so that you're careful not to uh release it in any um inappropriate context so you sort of release it out in the woods somewhere wherever they meet whatever but my point is that i don't care about words right you can be a dudist you ever heard of a dudist the great Lebowski, there's some movie where some group of people are do this. It's like, okay, whatever. Uh, tell me why. Tell me why. What is it about that community that attracts you to it? On the other hand, you know, you could, there's plenty of respectable fraternities or something where the real reason you want to be in there is you like to drink and have sex. That's really your motive. So it appears to be virtuous and it's not. Something else appears to be wicked and it's not. So that's what I like about philosophy. You can start anywhere and I will take you, you know, I'll just make you accountable. And if you break the golden rule, I'm gonna really hold your feet to the fire. What makes you think you could treat other people in a way you wouldn't want to be treated, right? That's, that, I, I don't think anybody can have a rational argument for that. Uh, that's when you've lost your mind. <laughs> okay, Michael, go ahead, your turn. Okay, um, so one of the quotes I pulled, um, give me one second. Um, it was actually towards the beginning. It doesn't actually have to do it explicitly. 
with humanism, but um, it's, it was just talking about philosophy as a whole. Um, and it was like a really basic sentence, but um, it teaches us to say what we mean and to mean what we say. Um, I, like I said, it's towards the beginning. Um, but I thought that was like a really, um, like it's a very general statement, but it's also like very particular to philosophy at the same time. Um, so I thought that was an interesting statement. And then um, the second point was, um, I can't remember, but the third one was about when they were talking about um, um, like uh, Christianity in the United States and how it's turned towards the social gospel. Um, and it was talking about how uh, it's moved from the idea of um, the idea of looking forward to this thing after life to the social gospel and doing things um, for like the current the current life kind of and kind of moving towards that more humanistic um, like approach, if you will. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Um, does anybody else want to, has everybody spoken on this round? Okay, I lose track. Um, does anybody want to clock in on social gospel versus um, focusing on the next life? Why it matters. I mean, we have this big Black Lives Matter, right? There are plenty of religious people on both sides of this debate, right? So what do you think are the best arguments for getting involved with Black Lives Matter or not getting involved or condemning it, right? It's, is it Christian? Is it anti-Christian? Or Christians don't worry about stuff like that, right? Okay, okay. Got, yeah, go ahead, Mary Hannah. Well, I think as Christians, we should be in support of Black Lives Matter because all lives should matter equally. And that's what hasn't happened if that makes sense. I mean, I guess that's just kind of broad, but that's just how I link them all together. Is if as, as Christians, I'm a Christian, I should treat everyone the same. Treat others as you want to be treated, the golden rule. Well, if that's the case, then you should start, support Black Lives Matter because our past says that we haven't. Right, because the evidence is that, yeah. Yeah, so if a Black Lives Matter, if that's the movement that needs to change it, then that's what should happen. All Christians should be in support of that. All right, Jason, what do you think? Yeah, I'm with uh, Mary Hannah on that. Um, I think we should, given the, the history. But not only that, but like, um, uh, if, if you like, I don't even think it has to do with Christianity or uh, religion at all. Like. As a person, if if you don't feel for like um, what's what's happened in the U.S. Well, uh, that's had um that's had to do with uh, African Americans. If you don't like, at some point, if you can't relate or sympathize or uh, empathy, uh, like empathize with them, like to I don't know, like, something might be wrong with you, buddy. Because like, how can you not look at that and say like, oh man, that that's that's wrong. You know, there's something has to be changed. Or something has to um. There has to be something to be, to be fixed in order for for that certain group of um, people to get the same treatment. Like you can't just say, I don't, you know, people have ran the numbers. They've talked about this and that, but I mean, the history speaks for itself. You know, they say, oh, that's not true about this. Or I, I know I'm not being specific. I'm being kind of vague and kind of um, skimming the surface with this, but like um they'll talk about like oh that's not true you had the same opportunity as this and and this and you mentioned it too like systemic racism um it's like as far as like numbers wise to prove it it, it's, it might not be there but it's it's there it's, it's happened before and and for you to sit there and say like oh no i don't i don't think so i don't know that's that's kind of hard to believe um like i said like i don't think it has anything to do with religion at this point it, it's like a 
it's a human thing. Like you should feel for your neighbor, you know, you should care about your neighbor. And like you said, like treat others how he wants to be treated. So uh, that's, that's my take on it. Okay, Titus, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with Mary Hannah and Jason, but I'm curious, like what are the other, like what were the arguments for the other side of this? Well, you know, there are, right? The white supremacy and all that stuff. Right. Like, I just wanted to hear an example of one. One of the biggest things that I saw, um, I, I actually like deleted my Facebook when Black Lives Matter was happening because the people that, the people from the area that I'm in, they're just, they're, they're so white and racist. Um, and, uh, but one of the, like, I feel like the biggest like push back was the, uh, the all lives matter you know, that was one of the biggest, like, pushbacks, Titus, that I think that I saw. Um, I think that would be an example. No, not a valid one. Okay. What about you, Trey? Oh, I'm not even going to lie. I didn't really hear the reading from this one, so... Well, I mean, this is just about, in general, Black Lives Matter, right? You know about that. Um, do you think a, a Christian would get involved or would be indifferent or would defend white people? Um, I most definitely think that a Christian would be involved on their, their thought on, on how they think of it. Because as God says, you know, God says treat everyone equal. So I believe that they would definitely like have a, a little bit of say so. And if they really felt like they loved us all or felt like everybody deserved to be treated as one, then I feel like they might have a, a voice and a thought in what's really going on. Okay. Now, I want you to stand back and think about what you've been saying, right? This is my job. Um, so a couple of you said, if you look at the history, right? So this is a case where we're integrating the study of humanities history with uh, religious, with philosophy, right? And with Christianity. So again, Christ when you have Christianity that's anti-intellectual though, they don't study the history right? They don't study it in a systematic way. And so let me give you an example of what sort of arguments are there on the other side, right? Well, some of them are flat out white supremacy, but some of them, people have stories, right? People have stories of the black person that got the job they didn't get, or the black person, the black guys that threaten my my police officer, wife or husband, right? But those, that's called anecdotal evidence, right? You can't make social policy just on stories. What I've noticed since I came to Arkansas is people don't talk in terms of policy. They just tell stories. And that's really a part of liberal education is that what's immediate, right? There's something immediate and it's emotional. But you have to stand back and say, is this an exception to the rule or is this a pattern that just keeps happening over and over and over? And the cause is all these other institutions and all this other culture that the way people um, design a legal system or apply it, apply the laws to particular people or enforce the laws. So, you know, for example, the, the voter suppression laws that are coming up, we know that they disproportionately marginalize the poor. We know that poor people are disproportionately non-white, right? And so the courts have tried to take it to say that this is racist and the Supreme Court has decided no, right? And, so the uh, Supreme Court is allowing some of this stuff. And here's where you come into history. People who know the history say, 
Jim Crow laws never said race in the law. That's what we don't know because we just Jim Crow. Oh, that's racism. No, none of those laws ever had the word race, but they were designed clearly, right? So we just keep repeating the history because we're ignorant, right? And so unless you tie your Christianity to history and social science, it you can't really do what, what I think, right? Jesus wants us to do, which is make the world a better place. Does that make sense? That Christianity really ought to be uh, integrate intellectual study, history. But when humanists keep condemning religious people as anti-intellectual, right? Or idiots or whatever, then you you know there are you know elitist humanist people that won't work with people who for whom Christianity is their foundation and there's absolutely no reason for that um, and I find it very annoying. Um, another issue that's very important systematically is when a society when an empire is in decline, which incidentally <laughs> is happening, we have choices about what we want to do. And um, when the middle class, it's harder. People, the rich have to do more to keep, if they want to keep a middle class. If they don't want to, what they do is they pit the lower level working class against the underclass. And that's what we've done. That happened in Vietnam. So the people who sign up for war are people for whom that's a good career move. But then uh, rich people will send them off to war, put them in harm's way. The intellectuals will criticize the people who sent them to war. They will say, you're criticizing the troops. <laughs> and so you're pitting. You're pitting people against each other, the intellectuals against people, the lower working class who are, who are trying, the intellectuals might be trying to get them to be more thoughtful about how they're getting used, but the rich will pit them, right? Pit the intellectuals against the working class. Or another good job opportunity for lower middle class is police officer right, pays money. But what you do is then again, you've pitted uh, predominantly white working class people against the underclass. And so, you, you know, a lot of police officers are in dangerous situations. It's just that everybody's got to step back and say, how did we get into this situation, right? And how do we get out of it? Because it's, it's a corrupting influence. It, it, uh, it corrupts everybody, it corrupts their judgment, it corrupts their ability to flourish. Um, so then the other, the other problem is um, the reasoning. So you can take logic class, but one thing is people really just tell stories. That's called anecdotal evidence or hasty generalization is that you jump to conclusions. Have you ever noticed that? Someone will, <laughs> you know, something happens and then they try to make sense out of it, but it's really jumping to conclusions and it, it's not wisdom. You're not, people will try to find an analogy between their situation and something bigger. And that takes a lot of intellectual training and education. But if you don't have the education, you will do it in a way that protects you, right? Promotes your interests, makes you feel more comfortable. Um, and so there's also willed ignorance. People decide they want to be ignorant. They like getting jerked around. Do you know, does that make sense to you? Do you think any people are really guilty of willed ignorance or do they really have good intentions and they just have stories and they'll never be convinced 
Do you mean people that like enjoy being on the opposing side? Well, I have people who deny that racism is an issue, right? Oh, I definitely know people that deny that. Okay, so what is it? Is it that their experience and they, you know, or are they just wanting to be ignorant? Or what do you think is going on in their heads? I know a lot of people that, um, like, especially with like, um, with like white privilege, for example, like they've grown up in like this exceptionally like poor, um, like poor, they're white and they've grown up in this like exceptionally poor um, background. And they think that like, yeah, because they, they're poor, um, they face these like disparities. They, they, for some reason, can't seem to understand that like, they were never like, they didn't face any of this, these disparities because of the color of their skin. And like, I don't know why they, but like, they just can't, they can't get that through their heads to, you know. Right, so they're making an analogy, right? That is uninformed. Does that make sense? But that's why social science, history, if you wanna be a good Christian, <laughs> You need to be educated. Does that make sense? You know, if you want to love God, love your neighbor, and then show you love your neighbor by making middle class, you really have an obligation to be educated so you can do a good job of it. Does that make sense, guys? Does that make sense to you, Trey? So how could you go ahead? I mean, what would the counter argument be? I... I mean, I don't know. Like, it, some of it makes sense to me, and some of it kind of doesn't. It, like, all, like, hearing all of it kind of just doesn't really add up. I really like to find out how other people think, you know? Um, because I try to, you know, you know, I try to get as complete a view as I can, and then I know that I can't see farther than this. But I was raised to think that, and so I know that there's things I'm not seeing, right? Um, I, I do know that you can use the social sciences to justify weakness of character. That really annoys me. <laughs> Does that make sense, Trey? Uh, a little bit. You know, okay, so white people are under stress, right? And then the social science say stress, blah, 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 90% of people experience blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't make any distinction between, you know, rich white people who are under stress and poor black people. I mean, I'm like, that's a big difference. Does that, does that make sense, Trey? Yeah. So I understand how this, all these tools can really be abused and um, that people who specialize in this stuff tend to use their specialization to justify themselves. So I think like there's like different levels to stress with like rich white people and poor black people. Cause I mean, uh, there's gotta be like some kind of different factor there. I know. And there's plenty of research that doesn't distinguish those things, right? Okay. So I remember going to a therapist once because I had six free sessions at my job. And so I thought, what the hell, I'm gonna do this, it's free. Uh, and I knew I wasn't going to have that job much longer. So, yeah, okay. Um, and, and so the reason I wanted to go is everybody I was talking to was somebody related to me. <laughs> and there was, you know, some problems in the family, but you couldn't get anybody who didn't have a vested interest, right, in having it turn out. So the, the therapist was just the detached observer. And she, it was funny because I said, okay, this time I wanted to get from here to here. And so about the third session, she said, well, you kind of already know everything I'm supposed to help people make, you know, become more aware of. I said, that's fine. This is what I want from you, you know? 
But what I saw, my point is that I saw her at the lunchroom and I saw her with the people she works with. And I thought, my gosh, she has this wonderful middle-class life. She's working with like-minded people. She's a privileged white lady. You know, she has a master's degree. And you know, some African-Americans, they can't get through the educational system to get the pieces of paper that would enable them to be therapists. And yet they would be much better therapists because these privileged white people don't get it. Just like I felt like this woman doesn't get my problem because she doesn't, you know, she has this professional respect. She has colleagues. So she, I just felt like she doesn't get me. And then I thought, what if I were black and what if I were poor? Oh my gosh, right? And then I find out that actually people who would be good therapists, who would have more empathy, can't get the pieces of paper because of all the white privilege involved in getting the K through 12 school to get into college, get into college, get the master's degree. Does that make sense to you, Trey? Yeah, so... I just, I hope that one thing you, you get from your liberal arts education is to try and unravel all of the complexity and come up with, you know, in your final worldview, you're not gonna solve every problem in the world, but sort of try to feel like in your worldview, you made a couple distinctions that really shed light on stuff that make a difference that you either changed your mind or you expanded your mind, right? And so I guess that that light that popped off when I looked at that woman and said, she has no idea what it, when I'm telling her about my problems, she doesn't, she has no empathy. I mean, she'll listen to me, but basically I have to solve this. And then if I were poor, I were, if I were black, oh my gosh. Um, so that helped me a lot. Every obstacle I ran into, I kept thinking, what if I weren't white? What if I weren't privileged? What if my parents didn't support me? What if I knew I would, wouldn't end up on the street? Because if I hadn't had middle-class parents and in-laws, I might have ended up on the street with little kids, you know, and all this stuff, it, it really helped me a lot to understand systemic racism and class issues. So like with Michael, I do think that partly they, white people have this privilege, but partly they, they're poor and they don't understand that they don't have equity in their house issues, which most people, that's a big source of wealth. And so they, they don't understand how profound it is that the discrimination in housing has made it so difficult for black people to get wealth because a lot of poor people in rural South, they don't have a lot of wealth either in their mortgage, but it's a serious national issue because for 75, 80%, that's, that is a huge difference in their overall wealth and their ability to use equity to pay for college for their children or grandchildren, right? Does that make sense, Michael? Um, yeah, it does. Like with that specific issue, it does. But I mean, we also see in the South, like, um, I don't know if you saw it, but like a few months back, um, a guy was in um, Harrison. Um, <laughs> yeah, holding up the yeah holding up the signs and like there's like blatant like exceptionally blatant racist acts happening in like you know in the same I don't know, I don't what, know. Was what was the sign what was the sign I think it was just Black Lives Matter oh really in Harrison yes wow I'm glad he didn't get well shot yeah. at <laughs> Yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely correct. But <laughs> I Harrison is, I mean, there's a town called Zinc a few miles outside of Harrison, and that is the national headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan. 
Right. So when you move, when you drive through there, there are these bulletin boards with this cute little white girl. Oh, you know, there's a reason we protect our whatever, you know, race or whatever. It's just that appeal to innocence. Yeah, it's it's sad. Um, I have you read the book? It's called White Fragility. No, I've heard about it though. Okay, yeah, I've been I'm almost almost all the way through it. Um, but it kind of talks about you know some of the, some of the 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 why behind we behind like why white people get so defensive and what, like kind of the, like the, the, the understanding that you were asking us for, which you, you probably do have more, you know, thought about that, but you know. Well, I, I really think after 9-11, my animosity doesn't go primarily, to, it goes to those people at the top that created this whole political rhetorical worldview, a fake worldview that they knew it was fake that our founders are fundamentalist Christians, that we have to get back to Christianity, that uh, gay people are evil. They didn't believe that. Dick Cheney had a gay daughter he's really close to. So that, that to me is the source of the greatest wickedness is when people with brains and education, privilege, money, use, you know, punch the buttons of people who they who aren't educated and who again they make it more difficult for them to get an education or to want an education they defund public education so they will be suckers right for political rhetoric that's where my number one animosity lies even though you know it's hard to be in Batesville because I know if people around me knew what I thought, they wouldn't like me, but I don't blame them. They've been manipulated. Does that make sense to the rest of you? Remember when Socrates, go ahead. At what point do you, you know, I, I feel at some point we have to start blaming them and holding them accountable. Oh, I understand, Michael. So what happened was, after about seven years, you know, before Obama got elected, during then I just felt like they want to get jerked around, right? They're not trying. So that I did sort of change. These people need to try to think thoughtfully. And I guess right now, the, the, the latest thing, I don't know if you know that the Arkansas legislature, these bills have been introduced so that teachers cannot teach students about the history of racism. I did not until you mentioned it the other day in class, but also if we're gonna be honest, it's not like we were ever getting the true story anyway. Right, it's just that some teachers have now tried to start telling the truth. And, right. and a lot of legislatures are introducing bills saying it will be illegal and serious punishments, right? I don't know for sure, lose your job, lose your pension. I mean, they can really use power. Right. So, so my point there is that Jason said, if you look at the history, right? And Titus said, yeah, that's why there's gonna be a whole generation of people, students who never know the history right and then they're gonna say that racism you know that they're not racist or that white people are superior one of those two it's it's worrisome does that make sense jason the backlash um but i do think blind students are a source of hope um but you'll just have to lead right and what might seem obvious to you, I'm telling you, you might be surprised that it isn't obvious to other people. Um, and that's where the leadership issues come in. Um, all right, so the next thing, so I hope, does everybody understand how this combined, how this is linked? I think all this discussion is linked to humanism versus religion and all this stuff. And this is where, these horrible polarizing 
issues are coming in and there's no need for it, right? There's no need to separate humanists from religion, religious people, <laughs> however you want to name them. Um, so I would say, let's see, we have just a few minutes, but 1933, right? You have uh, the emphasis, right? We need a new statement on religion. And then 1973, we need a new statement on religion, right? So some people think religion has to be continually adjusted to fit changes in the society. Other people think, no, give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It's good enough for Moses. It's good enough for me, right? And of course, that's what got Socrates into trouble. So liberal education, whatever else, it, it's based on the union of reason and faith and reason and faith not being watered down, but not being identified with conservative lack of change. Um, and of course, now it has gotten identified with that. And that's a serious problem. It's hard to have a democracy if people are going to vote or they're going to relate to other people based on you believe this or there's something wrong with you, then you're not willing to work together. You're even going to violate the golden rule if you think it's serious enough, right? These other people are wicked enough that you can't treat them like equals. That's the end of democracy, you know? Um, so you have to have some idea of God that would enable you to treat your fellow human being, your fellow citizen as equally capable of practical wisdom so that we can move forward. And our educational system would be based on cultivating practical wisdom. Remember Mr. Taylor's article. Um, and then technology came in and, um, and environmental stuff, ecological damage, that became a new thing. When I teach environmental ethics, it's very discouraging because we knew all this stuff 50 years ago and we have done nothing because the rich have decided they don't want to do anything. And they have the money for the political campaigns to make it that way. Then there's that debate about economics. Um, sexuality, that, and I said that in the pre-class pre video, people get obsessed, right? They get fixated on who's having sex. If you want fewer abortions, you should be, uh, you should make abortion legal and, and minimize poverty and sex ed and contraceptions. That's the way to minimize abortions. If you want more abortions, make it illegal. They'll go underground. Don't teach sex ed. Don't have contraceptives available and increase the poverty because that's why women get abortions. Teenagers get pregnant because they didn't have contraception. They didn't know they didn't have education. And because women are too poor to have another kid, that's why they get them. And they will get them if they want them, whether it's legal or not. That's why the number of abortions keeps going down as long as there are all these other things in place. But we get fixated on that, right? We get fixated on these things that are very immediate. They have to do with temperance. But look at all the other problems we have. Um, so I do think keeping things in perspective is very important for wisdom. Um, all right. And seeing how, right, violence, how do you, when you look at violence, you have to look at the systemic, the way the systems work. Um, Economic growth is a big deal. How are we going to do this in a high-tech era? But just violence, for example. Um, if, oh well, I mean, you guys all know this kind of stuff. The penalties for cocaine, which is rich people's drug, are a lot less than the penalties for crack cocaine, which is the poor people. The penalties for the guy selling 
on the street is way more than the penalty for the guy in the suburbs in the mansions who actually is, you know, connecting with the Mexicans and getting the system to work. Uh, you could go on and on about, but I do think you do have to look at it systemically. And that's what education does for you. You don't look at anything with your eyeballs. <laughs> you look at it with your mind and you try to, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. This is the secular humanism. What I did ask you all to bring your own version, right? Okay. So how many of you brought your own version? Because did everybody bring their own version of humanism? Michael, did you? Okay, Titus, did you? Yes, I made up a version. <laughs> okay, uh, just let me hold on a sec. Now, Trey didn't, right? Because you did the wrong. Okay, I do want to do you do it for Monday. All right. Um, Mary Hannah, did you just yes or no for the minute? Okay. What about Jason? Did you bring your, did you find something? No. Okay. Well, everybody has to do that. And so for now, we'll just have Titus and then we'll quit. Titus made something up. Bravo, Titus. <laughs> Go yes. ahead. I didn't really see, find anything online other than the common types So. I just basically made up an example of my own. And That's what I want you to do, buddy. You're oh. in your worldview. Go ahead. Then perfect. So I basically called this athletic humanism. And it's basically, you know how pretty much before every game, a team gets together and pray for success. And even announcers pray for other teams and stuff like that. I So I basically said the humanistic version of that is basically relying on yourself to saying that you're going to be the one that determine your own path or if you win this game or not, basically taking the religion out of it. Well, actually, the religion wasn't in there until after 9-11. That was... Really, you guys really need to understand this. After 9-11, our country got way more saturated with religion than it used to be. And you need to think that way just because like clearly like for most of us the entire time that we were born, at no point in time were we not saturated with religion, as you said. Um, yeah. But what's important for you to know is look at what we read today. America was radically humanist, right? The Europeans thought we were the flaming atheist, right? Pants on fire atheist because we separated church and state and we emphasized humanism. So really, I just want you to know you are getting a very false view. Uh, Maybe in your, in your school history classes, you're getting a distortion. I don't know. But even if you aren't, the culture is not what it was. And it was deliberately structured this way because now you have empire-based religion. It was people who wanted to set up an, the U.S. as an economic empire. It was their mission statement. After the fall, I can send you the mission statement if you want proof. They also wanted a religion that was empire based. So they started linking the state to a certain religion, well, Christianity, but you know, a certain kind of Christianity and anti intellectual. And they started praying at sports events and they started doing this stuff. So they know what they're doing. It's just that. I do want you all to think about this because now you've been raised in this post 9-11 empire building religious uh, climate, okay? And you really, I do want you to wake up to that and to you know, know that our founders, this is not what America was based on and they would be extremely worried about it. So if you want to write your paper about that, right, you can use virtue of an educated voter and you can use this Corliss Lamont stuff. Just 
just to get this stuff straight in your head and to get some historical information. So when you write your paper, I have these generic topics. But if there's something that you really pants on fire or want to write about, please do. Because you have now three hours or something of your life that you're going to get credit for setting that aside and thinking it through. And I hope you'll think of it that way. That, you know, usually you don't have time to study anything. Well, I'm giving you some time and also you're going to get credit, right? You'll get a higher grade on a class and a better, right? In other words, your, your career future and all that other stuff. But I want to link that as much as possible to, to students sorting things out in their head so they can see the context within which they were born and that they have lived. Okay, so good for you, Titus. And if you want to, um, if you want to pursue that a little further and say, uh, there's evidence that our founding fathers would not be very happy about this because God doesn't come in there and play favorites in a sports event, right? Our founders, their view of God, like I said, it was heretical. It was consistent with Newtonian physics. And that had a God that didn't intervene in history at all, all right? Some of them didn't believe any of those Bible stories about a literal God acting in history. That's our founders. That's how radical they were. So anyway, Titus, if you wanted to follow through on that a little bit, and if you wanted to write, you know, your second paper on athletic, human, and then you could write on what it should be, right? Because there are uh, students from Europe who do feel quite marginalized when it lie and if they pray before games and stuff. They've written about that. Right? They say, yeah, I, I was raised to be humanist and this isn't, I don't like it. I'm uncomfortable. I, obviously it would be, right? Does that make sense, Titus? Yes, ma'am. So you can write, you can write little screed, Titus Manifesto, right? <laughs> Athletic Humanist Manifesto, 2000 and whatever, the 21. Go ahead, Titus, why not? Um, <laughs> I'll see about it. Yeah, and you can always meet with me during office hours, right, to work it out. Um, okay, guys, I've kept you over. Have a good weekend. You can meet with me um, 9 to 12. I might be a little bit later on Sunday because I'm going to Shakespeare in the park with my grandkids. Hello. <laughs> Tough life. All right, we'll see you guys. Hey, Dr. Beck, can I talk to you? Sure.